Okay, well, welcome coaches tonight and thanks for joining us for this is the final positive coaching webinar of this series. Tonight we're going to hear from Guy Malloy from the Deakin Melbourne Boomers on the competitive cycle. My name is David Huxtable, I'm the General Manager of Basketball Victoria Country and I'll be your MC for tonight. Before we go any further, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we meet and I would like to pay our respects to Elders, past, present and emerging, as well as acknowledge any First Nation people that have joined us tonight. I'd also like to acknowledge the organisations that have assisted in bringing you these sessions. Firstly, the Latrobe Valley Authority Sporting Partners, which is the Collingwood Football Club, Melbourne Victory and the Melbourne Boomers. Special thanks to Gip Sport for co-hosting co these sessions and to our state sporting associations, Basketball Victoria Country, Football Victoria, AFL Gippsland and Netball Victoria. We've had over 140 people register and attend at least one of the positive coaching webinars and tonight we expect over 50 to attend. For this reason, I'd like to remind you to keep your webcams off and your microphones on mute so we can all focus on what Guy has to tell us. Please feel free to chat in the chat room as this is a great way to stay engaged in the sessions and share your ideas, comments and feedback with fellow participants. Learning from each other is an important part of the experience, so please feel free to join the discussion and be respectful of everyone's opinion and comments. We don't expect Guy to monitor the chat room, so that will be done by myself and Ryan, and we will uh, look to ask all those questions at the end of the session. So please, from past experiences, get in early with your questions to ensure that they get asked and answered. So tonight our guest presenter is from the Del Deacon Melbourne Boomers, Guy Malloy. So Guy's got an extensive coaching resume. He began coaching basketball in 1985 while studying a degree in sports coaching at the University of Canberra. Just showing your age a little bit there, Guy. Since then, he has coached over 150 games at, of national teams. So that's the head coach of the Australian under-21s and under-17 men's team. And with that under-17 men's team, he won a silver medal in Lithuania at the World Cup in 2012. He's been a head coach at the NBL level with Cairns, Taipans and the South Dragons, as well as a stint of coaching the Vic Country under-18 men's team in 2013. He also won three gold medals as the Victorian Metro under-18 men's coach at national championships. But it's in the WNBL where Guy has really found his niche. He's been the head coach of the Deakin Melbourne Boomers for the last seven seasons, taking the club to finals on four occasions. Prior to that, he was the head coach of the Perth Breakers for four years, also four final appearances. And prior to that, he spent one year as head coach of the Canberra Capitals. He's been twice named WNBL Coach of the Year. And last year, coached his 250th game in the WNBL, which saw him inducted as a life member. And also... If that's not enough, he's also in his second term with the New Zealand Tall Ferns as coaching uh, their senior women's team. I think I'll hand it over to you now, Guy. Good luck, and um, we'll ask some questions at the end. Hux, thank you very much. Uh, really pumped, excited to be here and talking to everybody tonight. I'm, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, hopefully this goes to plan. Can you see that screen there for me, Hux? Has that come up? Yes, all looking good. All right, perfect. So I, I want to get into this topic uh, of something that I call the competitive cycle. And um, But before I get into that, uh, there are some things that uh, are kind of non-negotiables. If we don't get them right, then you won't have much context about what I'm, I'm talking about. And I know that some of these things have been covered in, in previous um uh, webinars that you've had. But look, let, let me just go through a, a few things by way of introduction, and, and then I want to jump right into this competitive competitive cycle stuff. Um, the, the first thing, and uh, let me see if this is going to work. Okay, coaching philosophy. And I'm sure that every coach educator that you guys have come across, no matter what sport, has been ramming down your throat the idea that you've got to have a coaching philosophy and I'm no different because this is something um, even with uh, well over 30 years of coaching at elite and professional levels it, it's something that I address and um, and refine on probably a monthly basis and so a, a coaching philosophy is a, is a set of guiding principles that become your compass and it should be a short uh, but memorable statement, but something that's consistent with your basic personality and knowledge. So 
we need this. We need this no matter if you're, if you're coaching an Olympic team or an NBL team or you're coaching the local under 10s because you, your coaching philosophy tells you what to decide and how to act and how to behave and how to make your decisions. And, and it's just integral to everything. And, and it's much better for us to be active than reactive. And uh, I've just got a couple of notes there. So uh, a coaching philosophy will form of its own accord, for better or worse, unless you create one for yourself. So don't think that this is something that you could just um, not have or don't need because your style, your personality, your preferences will come out and that philosophy will form itself organically. So it's kind of better to be really active and create one for yourself. Um, in early stages, it's not unwise to mimic the philosophy of an experienced coach so long as you do so in a manner that's consistent with your own personality. And um, I can tell you from my own personal experience that some uh, outstanding coaches in world basketball that I was heavily influenced by in early stages of my career that I um, did the positive thing of trying to mimic what I thought that the positive parts of their philosophy were, but um, I also tried to do that out of my own personality. And uh, it took me a little bit of time to learn that it, it's it's fine to take the, the positive parts of the philosophy, but you've got to do it in a way that's consistent with your own uh, manner and the way that you behave and, and, and so on. Um, and then your philosophy, it tells you how you act or behave, how you make decisions, how you create standards, how you deal with criticism. And we know that's a big one for coaches. I'm a, I'm a um, look, uh, living in Victoria, a uh, bit of an anomaly because I'm a huge NRL fan and and five coaches have been sacked in the NRL this season already out of 16 teams. And and the criticism there has been immense uh, of, of those five gents who uh, fell on the sword. So criticism is a big part of, of what we have to deal with. Um, approaching adversity, determining a playing style, responding to success and failure, defining your purpose, all those things should be encapsulated in your philosophy because that's um, it's your compass. And I've just got a few examples of things that I've come across over the years and, and um, uh, philosophies that other coaches have told me or I've summarised and I'll let you read through them there. And, you know, the first one, well, coaching for me is... It's not mine, but this is what it says. Coaching is recruit the best players, make them play as a team and keep it simple. And that kind of, it, it gives you, it, it's a robust philosophy. It's not mine, but it, it's kind of, it, it gives you a way that, well, that's how they go about the job. And you can tell that type or style of coach would, uh, seems to be very player uh, friendly or player centric in the way that they approach it. They want to get good players. They probably don't want to get in their road too much. Maybe they're not confident in their own teaching ability or they want to let the players own that themselves. And so, um, uh, you know, the, they'll, they'll do the minimum and uh, that, that may be very successful and work. Um, if you look at example number three there, I've got fun fitness and fundamentals and in brackets juniors and, and I think that that's a wonderful coaching philosophy for so many junior teams. And I think that that um, that kind of statement, um, you, you can't go far wrong if they're the guiding principles, if they're the compass by which you coach junior sport. Uh, you can get an old school way. And when I started a lot of coaching and what you were told is, well, you've got to be tough, got to be strong. It's my way or the highway. And, and, and that was a real old school thing. And, and the coach was... Uh, you know, back in the 80s when I started coaching was very dictatorial about uh, how things went and they, they were the strong figures in coaching back then and, uh, you know, so on. So, I mean, it, it's up to you to, to think carefully about what your approach and what your philosophy is because it's going to have a major impact on uh, the way that you go about this competitive cycle that I talk about. And, uh, look, I um, if there's any questions... I, you know, happy to uh, to take them, and uh, um, I, I I believe that this has been addressed in previous webinars. But uh, this this is such an important area, and and I think that it's um, uh, I'd, I'd be happy to talk further about it. But look, let's let's move right on. So, 
the, the second non-negotiable thing I think we need is to learn a sound teaching method. And I've, in my time, delivered lots of the the um, level one, level two type coaching courses, and and I feel like this is an area that is really lacking. Uh, either we learn to to coach by how we were coached as kids, or uh, we we go and do a course, and it'll tend to focus on fundamentals and things, but it doesn't really tell you how you go about uh, doing that work with players, and so. Forming a good method is just imperative. And, and there's a really simple one here that I've outlined for you, which is just show players what to do and then tell them what to do and then have them show and tell you back so they can repeat it back to you. And that's all about good explanations and good demonstrations. The fourth part, giving feedback, is where many of us as coaches uh, can fall down and fail and, and giving uh, accurate and correct feedback is a skill that does take time. Um, again, this webinar is not about that, but uh, I'd be happy to answer questions on it. Point five, providing repetition through drills and games. And then point six, praising good examples when you find them. And I just want to make a point about that because these uh, these seminars are about positive coaching. Because I reckon that um, uh, we, we've seen a generational shift. There's no doubt in my mind about that in, in the sense that uh, I, I reckon that when I was a kid playing sport, a lot of the time was, well, if you didn't do the right thing, then your coach or parents or whoever were running things were, were probably pretty quick to point out when you weren't doing good things. And I reckon that what's needed these days is we've got to be very positive in looking to find times and examples of when players do the right thing. And we have to hunt for those. So in the course of a drill or small-sided game or whatever we're working on a practice that week, don't be afraid to, to stop things and really point out yeah, uh, little Johnny or Sarah or whoever else has, has done a great job. And, and this is a really good example of, of what we're after. And then 7.7 um, 7 there, you use tools such as next time or keep an ad. And, and what I mean by that is, uh, again, when I was going through my early stages of learning to coach, we had something called the sandwich method, which was, um, you know, think of something nice to say deliver the message that you really want to deliver, which was usually the, the corrective part, and, and then, um, you know, hopefully throw in a bit of a compliment at the end. So the sandwich was the, the two positives were on either side of the negative. But um, it, it's far more efficient with your language to look for, um, look for and praise good examples, and then when you have to correct it, so it could be, uh, you, you know, Billy, um, Great footwork when you when you caught the basketball. Next time, hold your follow through a little longer, and so it's brief language, and it tells Billy what to do when you get out of there. Or if or the keep and add method might be uh, uh, okay. So Billy, um, you've got to keep that intensity on your cutting when you caught the basketball. Next time, add a fake to that. All right. So a keep and an add gives uh, really. Uh, positive language, how you can um, be an influential coach because you're not really delving into all the, the murky psychology these days around negatives and, and, um, and correction being taken personally or being taken the wrong way. So learning a sound teaching method, and, and hopefully that's of, of some benefit. Um, next thing, learning to bring a team together. I'm not going to spend a lot of time in this. I know you've had uh, some good culture building sessions, but um, non-negotiable standards, forming closer friendships, um, getting a trademark game style for your team, I, I think is is such a, or your program is such an important thing. Finding your own rituals, your own social events, um, encouraging player ownership or athlete ownership of, of things rather than everything being coach-led or driven creating leadership groups, which is obviously the way things are done a lot in professional teams. So um, not only do we want to find a sound teaching method for individuals, then we've got to be able to bring all those individuals together within our program. 
The, the fourth thing that I, I just want to um, encourage you strongly about is learn the basics of physical movement. And some of the individual sports leave us for dead. Um, and I know that uh, I had a period of time once where I, I spent four years coaching at the Western Australian Institute of Sport. I was the head basketball coach there. And surrounding me was um, swimming coaches and gymnastics coaches and um, cycling coaches and, and um, their, their knowledge of uh, the sports sciences really put me to shame. And uh, even though my actual degree was in, um, in uh, the sports science human movement field, and that really made me think want to learn more about the basics of physical movement. And I know that in, in the sport of basketball, which is mine, that as I go around and, and look at lots of junior training sessions, uh, that we, we have tons of kids these days that just really run poorly. And they are knee, uh, serious knee injuries waiting to happen, ACLs and all that type, type of thing, because they can't squat jump and land, do all those things correctly, uh, let alone moving on to more complicated physical movement skills like pivoting and sliding and, and, and so on and so forth. So I think that we've got a little bit of a role in that physical literacy, um, but it's my experience that we're undereducated in those areas and, and perhaps our coaching courses don't do a good job to prepare us for that. But I guarantee for you to learn your craft as a coach that any expertise that you can build in those areas by either your own study or finding really good strength and conditioning coaches that can teach you the basics to what to look for, you will increase the athletic prowess and be able to diagnose fundamental problems that your players may be having if you've got some physical literacy coaching ability. And, and I would really, really encourage you to look into that area. Um, and then the last thing is something that we call a game model, which uh, is a new term. When, when I was growing up, I was just called phases of the game. But everyone now in um, all the sports that are called invasion sports like basketball and soccer and, and AFL and netball and others, that uh, the, the, the game model describes different phases. So And it all works in a circle. So you can see that offence and offence leads to a contested possession um, that turns into a transition to defence. Then you head to defence then you contest possession again and then you go, you transition to offence, which in basketball is a fast break and then you're back into offence again and so forth. So each of those areas, though, of the game model gives you a couple of things. It gives you a potential area for an advantage. It gives you a, uh, a potential edge because that's what you study, because you may particularly like that phase of the game a little bit more than other phases of the game. It provides a trademark for you. And when you think about all the great professional sporting teams that in, in your sport you might like to watch, you could probably say, well, you know, that team's got some trademarks. And uh, I, again, I know in basketball, the great teams that I love to watch, you can point to different areas of the game model and go, well, look, they don't have a weakness because they've got every area covered off. But look, they're, they're particularly good here and here. And I think that uh, learning about game modelling is a great way for you to get a more comprehensive knowledge of the entirety of your sport uh, and also then to, to find some favourite areas that you can concentrate on, develop skills in, uh, in turn educate your players about, and it might be something a lot different to what they, um, what they just generally get. So in, um, in each of those things, that's kind of a preview, and it leads to this thing called the competitive cycle. And, and again, I apologise if that's uh, stuff that you guys have covered in in uh, previous webinars, but um, all of that is where I've had 30 something years of building a craft in those things. And, and, and uh, I, I just think that, that they're critical and each of those areas 
um, I'll put a lot of study into on a daily and a, and a weekly basis. So what's a competitive cycle? Well, we often hear that uh, coaching's uh, a journey, and uh, I used to think the same thing. Um, but I got to a point that I realized it's, it's much more of a mini cycle of, of um, five phases that just repeats and repeats and repeats itself. And I don't know what the ambitions are of people that are listening to the seminar here, uh, whether you uh, are a beginner coach or a parent and you're just happy to help and you're looking for a few clues for your uh, junior team. Um, my, um, my theory though, is that a lot of the coaches that attend these seminars, are have moved beyond that level. Um, you're intermediate to an advanced level coaches and, and you're looking for ways of how you really develop your craft, perhaps how you become a professional, how you have a, a career and the rate of burnout in coaching and the difficulties associated with the adversities and criticisms and, and all those sorts of things mean that uh, coaching as a journey uh, kind of defines it in a way that's incorrect for me. I want to break it down further than that. I want to make it more digestible. And that's why uh, this idea of the competitive cycle um, resonates. So the first thing is, and where we start is just, we play the game, we compete. And I'm gonna circle back to that point because um, everyone's got the game that they play, whether it's AFL and, and two pro teams are going against each other, or it's, um, you, you know, the, the Hawks are playing the Eagles in the local domestic comp. So we, we get to that point and, and we've got the game. And uh, this is usually what happens. So uh, we play on the left-hand side, we win. Coach feels great. Um, coach might even think they're a bit of a genius. Uh, things go the other way. You lose. You feel like crap. Those damn refs or uh, 20 other excuses or people that we want to find to blame. And, and that's the emotional cycle of it. And if, if you've done much coaching at all, uh, we're all very, very prone to that. And, um, you know, there's got to be a, a, a better way. And... Um, so in, in looking for a better way, the, the first point that I come to is something that I call decompress because all of us involved in sport love to compete normally and we're competitive people and uh, you win, as we showed you, you feel pretty good, you lose, you can feel fairly down. So this next part of the cycle where I say decompress, there's, there's a golden rule that I have. First of all, don't say anything much straight after a game. So after you've got your team together, and let's say you've had a loss to a rival, that kind of thing, offer some general positives and encouragement, but try and leave it at that. And it might just mean, look, uh, tough day today, but we'll get them next time. Um, you know, get into your recovery, eat well, uh, have a good night's sleep. We'll see you all at training on next Tuesday. And that is a pretty good statement to make. Uh, more damage has been done by coaches losing their cool after a game than anything else. And again, uh, I put my hand up as being guilty that uh, for, for quite a number of years early in my career that uh, a hot head after a losing performance could take me a week to a month of trying to uh, smooth the waters and, and, and soothe um, the, the psychological damage because I've had a hot head directly after a game and it took me a while to learn this. So win or lose, a golden rule is don't say too much straight after the game. This is part of your decompress part. These are the most valuable tools that you've got and I know I'm a bit old school with this but uh, a, a notepad, a pen and a set of index cards and this is how we started. Um, this is a game preview. And I'm going to come back to this game preview, but here's where your game, this is where your decompress starts. Let's say as soon as the game's finished and I talk about a 24 hour window, it's useful to grab that pad and pen. And that's because my preference is to use those. And I'm not saying you can't use a computer or do what you want, but I start to get down on thoughts 
uh, my thoughts on the review of the game. And this would be a typical, I've typed this one out, but I normally just handwrite this in my notepad. So in the game review, you can see at the top, I just created the result. We won 85, 75. Uh, down the left-hand side, I put some key stats in there. Um, and each sport will have their key stats for, for possession and, and scoring and shooting and all that kind of thing. I'll do that for us. I'll look at a comparison for the opposition, and then I'll write down the stats of the key individuals. Um, then I put down the timeline, and in, in this um, imaginary timeline, you can see that I've uh, sort of basketball game goes for 40 minutes, obviously. So. I've, uh, on, on the stat sheet that you're given after a game, it, it gives you the score at five-minute blocks. So, um, you know, after five minutes, we were four points. The other team was 10. They've, they've started pretty well. Uh, half time at the 20-minute mark, uh, we're five points down. We've scored 40. They've scored 45. Uh, we, we've had a pretty good second half. And we've come out on top, won the game 85-75. And uh, I'll write all those things down. And then uh, the, the bulk of this page, and, and it's a single page that I limit myself to, is I'll just make my notes and reflections on the game. And um, that may be as uh, much as, gee, we had a, a really strong defensive night. We had a, a pretty poor shooting night. Uh, our energy was, was lacking in the warm-up. Uh, the other team jumped us at the start with a pressing defense. We got be behind early. We were two points down at the quarter. We were five points down at the half. Um, at halftime, we had some foul trouble. Uh, I, I had to give a bit of a rev up to the team. Um, so I, we, we changed a couple of points about our defense. Let's say we went from a man-to-man -to, -man to a zone or something like that. And I'll make all those notes while they're fresh in my mind. And um, they, they become... Uh, an incredibly uh, valuable tool. And um, I've got to do that, and this is my rule, within 24 hours. So I systematize it, win or lose. I'll make that review that I just went through. Uh, we'll watch and we'll edit the video and hear my assistant coaches uh, are valuable. And I think that even for, for most levels of sport now, uh, junior levels included, that we... We widely use video, which is a good thing. I'll write my match summary, which I've shown you how to do. Uh, I'll, I'll talk to uh, my key staff that I need to talk to. We'll find out if there are any injuries reported. Uh, I'll check in. I'll make some phone calls if necessary because uh, I'm coaching pro teams. I've got to ensure that our recovery is going to plan. And the bottom bullet point, which is the most important, is that I've got 24 hours to flush the game emotionally out of my system. So whether we've had a big win against the Crosstown rivals or we've had an agonising one-point loss in double overtime, um, I, I give myself that period of time. And, and, and you, you have to get off that roller coaster as quickly as you can. So the best way I've found to do that is to create a routine, and uh, that helps that decompression part. So from there, we've got to take that and we go to the next phase of the cycle and that's that we want to learn. So how do we go about it? So learning largely revolves around uh, video feedback to the team and to individuals. Um, and when we have our video sessions, we'll break them into, into short and pretty focused sessions. So from the, the match review that I did, um, we, we may have felt, for example, that our um, execution of our defense was, was pretty poor in a game. And uh, we'll look for generally eight to, to 12 video clips um, as a maximum that we could then uh, lead the team through in a video session uh, and really get the players talking about that. They're not all coach-led. Uh, we we want to put some circumstances up on the video screen for everybody to watch. And we ask a lot of questions. So 
um, you know, for our players, it, it's not well. Look, uh, you know, we, and we got we got a, a young superstar player over in the American NBA at the moment called uh, Ezzy Magbagor, who's playing for Seattle. But so just using Ezzy as an example, it, it, it might not be well. Ezzy, you've just you failed to execute the required defense on that screen. The the question will be, um, Ezzy, what happened here? Or what was your coverage, Ezzy? And we'll try and get her to then talk it through for us. Or another one of our players, um, like Kayla George, who who um, starts for the the Opals, the national team. It could be uh, Kayla. Talk us through this sequence. What were you thinking here? And uh, we we find that uh, that learning is a group activity. And um, by selecting carefully where we think we can improve with appropriate video feedback and getting the players to really engage and talk through this, uh, we, we find we get great results. Um, and again, the temptation from the coach is to, is to you know, you want to jump right in and sometimes you want to kick some butts and uh, let, let some of your players know that they've not followed rules or let things down pretty badly, but it, it's not, we don't want the intelligence in your head. We want the intelligence in the game. And, and so how do we get the intelligence from the plan that the coach is trying to put in place and get it out there amongst the playing group? So for our players, it, we will generally find out if errors that we're making and how we learn, is that related to confusion or lack of clarity uh, as a message from the coaching staff and in our preparation? Or has there just been a lack of effort or a lack of mental preparation? So we, we can tend to zero in and find out where the, where the real issues occurred. Uh, also, we'll, the coaches all find some extra time for individuals uh, with a bit of video. And then all our feedback um, is, is always relevant to the role and the expectations of, of any player that we have. So, um, you know, we, if, if we have, for example, a guard in basketball, then we won't give, um, evaluate them uh, or provide negative feedback to them in areas that are kind of may have happened in the game, but are generally outside of their role. So we try and keep those things on mission as much as we can. Now you can say, well, look, you're coaching uh, pro teams and, and, you know, you've got assistant coaches and, and um, is that important? Is video important for me? I'm coaching the local under 14s or the, or the junior rep team. Uh, yes, it is. And it may not be the, um, the, the quantity of work that senior teams get into, but again, this is part of the competitive cycle that's almost an unavoidable um, area. So I would really encourage you to build into your routine the ability to uh, get the video of your contest and then find a way to break it down. Now, you don't have to go and spend thousands of bucks on sports code and game breakers and all that sort of stuff that, that we use. I mean, you, you can work your eye movies and that kind of thing. But just even finding eight to 12 clips of your team's performance, even for younger kids, and then finding a way that you can show them, get some popcorn, have a social event. Uh, obviously, once we're out of this uh, bloody lockdown, and uh, off you go. But that, that's a terrific way to, to generate your learning. So after the learning, we've got to grow. And remember, I talked to you about uh, our game model. So our game model were the phases of our game, offense to, to possession, to defensive transition, to defense, to, fast, uh, to possession again, to fast break, and, and that circle turns. So we want to review our game model in relationship to the last game. And what I mean by that is, did anything fail under pressure? We're looking for reasons why. And we're looking for reasons why so we can grow. So if, if it's a team that was able to extend, say, their defense and beat you in uh, a, a very aggressive pressure style of game, then it, it 
points back to your uh, corresponding area of your game model where you were weak. So when you think about it, competitive sports, one team against another team or one individual in an individual sport competing against another is just a battle of game models and your game models collide. And where somebody gets an edge in one area, there's a corresponding weakness in the other person's game model. And this is something that you can be aware of. So in basketball, we're very, very acutely aware in our team, for example, if, say, the other team is able to score a lot of fast break points because it's usually a good way to win basketball games. The corresponding area of our game model that may be weak is something that we call our defensive transition. So did our defensive transition fail under pressure? So then we would take something like that. Well, now do we need to break it down and execute it better? And then we would write out our list of areas to attend to for the next set of trainings. And then we would talk about any remedial work that our players may need to do because everyone will have a role and a job uh, within that style of defense. And if you think back to um, and why I took the time to quickly run you through it, um, I, I've just got the notepad and, and that A4 spiral notepad I've got three tools that I use. I've got a pen, I've got a notepad, and I've got index cards. And, and on that notepad, we'll do our game plan, our game preview, the games played. I've got to decompress. I turn the page over. I write out my match report. After I've done that match report, I look at my video. And then straight after that, I get into this part. Where do we grow? What parts of our game model broke down? What do we have to address in the week that's coming up? So you can see now that we've been through four of the phases. We've competed, we've decompressed, we've learned, we've watched the video, we've analysed the video in respect to the plan and the game model that we've had. Uh, now we grow from that. We analyse our areas of mistake and then we get on to the fifth part, which is prepare. So I go back to the same notepad again, and um, uh, I've got boxes upon boxes of, uh, you know, uh, many decades in coaching of using these uh, A4 spiral notepads. Uh, so they stack meters high, and, and it's a method that has worked really well for me uh, because everything's in the same place. So from what I learned and what the team learned last week, now we'll start to devise our practice plan. And I know for some of our junior coaches watching, that may be one training session a week. For some, it may be two. Uh, for us, it's a case where we can train every day if we want to train every day. But our practice plan will um, come straight from our game model. And I've just given you an example there. So I always write the practice number and the date and the venue. Um, I break it into three columns. So I put a time and a duration um, and then whatever the drill and, or game, small sided games or notes are that we're working on. Um, I put the time, I put how long for the drill and then exactly what we're going to cover, uh, what our points of emphasis are, what coaches might be working with certain people um, and that, is done in advance. So on the same notepad, once that practice plan's completed, so let's say we played on the Saturday, I had my 24 hours on the Sunday, I've done my video, we've done the review, um, we've come back in, practices on the Monday, and it's all in the same place. I turn that page over and now I do a practice review. And so everything that I've just taken from the previous slide, this practice plan, I will go through it and I'll review it. And so I'll make notes. So I might put, well, look, it was very quiet in the warm up. You know, we need more energy there tomorrow. Uh, the defensive drills were excellent, but we fouled too much. So we've got to repeat those drills tomorrow. The coaches need to call fouls. Uh, the coach, I talk too much. We need shorter corrections. The shot selection was average, um, blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, everything that we set out to do, which is very purposeful and intentional, has then got its own um, review period. So uh, it takes us back to the start. So we've competed, we've decompressed, we've learned, 
uh, we've grown, we've prepared, and we're right back again to the following Saturday, we're competing again. And so I will take everything that we've written through that particular week, and I'll create this uh, in the same A4 pad, the game preview. And I'll write up there. So it's the game versus whoever, Townsville, Perth, Adelaide, the date uh, where we're playing. Um, I'll write down uh, up here our starters. Obviously, there's five in a basketball game. The opposition starters, their key stats, how we'll rotate our bench, uh, how the opposition tends to rotate their bench. And then I'll kind of write out this part here, what we've figured out our key defensive tactics are and our key offensive tactics. And they really form our plan A. So that's how we intend to play the game. And then over here on the other side, I'll take these special notes that I've, um, that we've either seen from the other team, we've noticed in previous times that we've played them. So, you know, their fitness has dropped away late in games or, when they rotate to their bench, their backup point guard comes in, then we've got to look to press. Uh, maybe it's a personal note, like I've got to be a more calming influence in timeouts, or I've got to rotate our subs quicker. And then I always make this note about plan B, because we always need plan Bs, and sometimes plan Cs, because games don't always go how we want them to go. And... Uh, if those key defensive tactics and key offensive tactics aren't working for us, then what can we change? And uh, I just don't want to rely on the fact that, uh, you know, we're, we're 10, 15 points down at half time, and the half time address is just to yell and scream like a madman at everybody to say, look, we just, we just got to. We just got to play. We just got to play harder. I mean, and, and, and you know, sometimes that is the message, but it, it's not that often. And, and um, it's usually to do with your tactics and usually to do with your method and usually to do with some confidence, either collective or individual. So um, noting areas that we know that we can adjust because we practice these adjustments gives us that good plan B. So that then goes to my uh, other favorite little tool, which is a, an index card. And I then take everything that we've done uh, through the week, um, those little small, I don't know what size they are, A5 index cards, whatever else they fit in your pocket. And on the front of them, I write down everything that I think that we need to know um, that we've worked on during the week and we may need to play in that game. So in basketball terminology there, we've got our horns offense and our thumb offense and our sets against zone and special situations and what our plan be. So everything that I think we need uh, to win that game is on the front of that index card that fits in my pocket while I'm coaching the game. And um, that is important because I, I and I learned this the hard way is that sometimes you set out to practice you play against somebody and you go well uh, you know gee I really reckon that uh, if we had to use this defense or that defense against that team we might have got a win there but I just forgot all about it so the point of your index card is that the main things are written there when you flip that card over on the back of the card, what I put, put there are the key address points that I want to make to the to the team <clears throat> pre-game. Um, so I'll write out uh, three or four of the key talking points before the game, that which are which are basically reminders. And also on the back of my index card, I like to put a few personal reminders, and they could be things like, well, you know. Um, no talking to the refs tonight or um, got to be really positive with uh, with these couple of players because they're a bit down in confidence or, um, you know, I, I need to show more energy on the bench tonight. So that little index card that I take kind of encapsulates everything that we've worked in in terms of the game plan and review and uh, the learning and growth through the week and the practice planning and the practice review 
everything that we've done is remembered and the main parts go on that index card and then that goes into my pocket. Um, and I think that the last point on that, just before I finish, because it is about time, um, that the reason that I restrict myself to writing a page at a time and to using an index card like this is because it forces me to uh, only put the most essential information. So I can't go over because let's face it, our athletes can't take in too much information. They've got all the pressure of the contest to deal with. Uh, and I know that when I've done or tried to do too much uh, and it's two or three pages of information, it falls flat on its face. So less is more. And uh, Hux, that is about uh, a ton of stuff that I put into uh, a, a discussion on the competitive cycle. Um, but it is, it is a really uh, essential or major part of my weekly work as a coaching professional. And um, yeah, I'm really happy to answer any questions on that or the earlier philosophical stuff. That's excellent, Guy. Thanks very much for that. That was great. Um, I've actually got a question first off. Uh, a lot of our coaches will um, will coach in, in tournament type play. So they'll head into January into the Eltham Dandenong tournament or the, one of the other tournaments. Your experience in like the under 17 Australian team, would you do an abbreviated version of this when you're heading into something like um, a, a tournament? Yeah, uh, um, really good question. And, and you do because week to week club coaching is is completely different to tournament coaching but i keep the principles the same and uh the information is even more pointed and uh i have something i call a rule of threes i love coaching in threes and what i mean by that is that i will um in a tournament setting um, it may just be that we've got uh, three points of emphasis for the game itself. Um, and when we uh, play that particular game and we get into our review process, obviously I don't have 24 hours necessarily to, to, to flush things like, like we do on the week to week competition. So that's got to work a lot faster, but we get into review and we will only review the three areas that we set out to, to do well in. So I think what's really confusing at tournament time is that you play your first game and then the coach comes in with, well, that was all crap and 12 areas went wrong and now everyone's completely confused. So you've got to pick your priorities. And I know that when I've um, uh, coached Australian or New Zealand teams internationally, we try to be good in that rule of three. So we pick three game model areas that we want to be outstanding in. Um, and, uh, you know, so for example, that, that, uh, and this is just comes back to my philosophy, but we try to be great in our half court offense in tournament basketball. Uh, we try to be great in our half court defense. Um, but we also like to have a defensive press up our sleeve because we find that a lot of the international nations, particularly the Europeans don't deal too well with that. So they're the three things that we restrict ourselves to. And the rest of the game model, we just can't get involved in. We don't have time. So we've got to stick to evaluation on those things. The number of video clips will become shorter. Uh, the time of meetings becomes shorter. The decompressed time becomes shorter. We've got to learn quicker. And learning quicker in itself for tournament teams should be something that you're evaluating your athletes on when you go to select them because it's my experience come tournament time, if I've got the choice between two comparable level players and one's got a better IQ to learn the game, I will pick that player in preference to somebody who takes a long time to learn tactics and strategies. No worries. We've got a couple of other questions. So um, one question here is, does the notepad limit how much you analyse? Is there a trap to provide too many messages to players? Um, the notepad length is perfect for me. As I said, it's a great constraint. Uh, and, and again, I talked about rules of three, which are an important tool for me. And the power of constraints is another one. So I found over time that handwriting and being restricted to one page. So if I write out a practice plan and it's a page and a half, I'm doing too much. I'm not going to get it covered. 
so I've got to draw a line through a bunch of stuff and reduce it back to a page or less. And then I find that that will work well for me. If I come out with a game plan, and again, it goes to two or three pages, I have to go back and like a writer, I have to draft it and redraft it and redraft it and cut the fat out until I can get it back to max of a page. So I've just found over time, like it, it it's not, it's what works for me and, and it's worked well. And, uh, and I think it's helped me uh, think a lot about what is the right amount of information that my players can deal with. And um, I've got a question about extra training sessions. Is there a time where you feel that with your team that you're just going to have to put in some extra training sessions? There's a particular weakness or something. Is there a trigger point for that? Well, again, it goes back to the game modelling. And, um, and, and this is only a fairly, I, I guess, recent term. It's a very popular topic in soccer. Um, and... Um, I think they call it tactical periodization or something like that. So it you're being remedial. That's what you're being. And so if, if you're finding that uh, um, if you're being exposed in the same way in contest after contest, then it is an error in your own approach to your game modeling that you're not making it a priority to correct the next time. So th th this is a bit of stubbornness in, and inflexibility by coaches because, uh, and, and, you know, I've certainly been guilty of this as well. I've got my favourite things to do, so I do them first, and when I'm happy they're okay, then I'll address a couple of other things. So let's say that I've got my favourite offence and we run that to death, and when I'm happy with that, then we might do a little bit at the end. But week after week when we play, then we're really hurt with our rebounding. And, you know, I kind of like, well, I'm a bit blasé about that, but what's screaming out to me is that I'm the coach, I've got to fix the problem. So the remedial thing to do is to make rebounding a priority to put it at the front of my practice session, uh, follow my rule of threes, make sure that it's one of the three things that I get done and anything else is a bonus. So um, our, our, um, our, to answer that question specifically, I'm hoping that we cover, we make the decisions to cover the right priority areas that need to be addressed um, and that we don't go over time too much because our planning is poor. If we need to go over time or do extra work, it may just be because we're time poor. Hopefully it's because we're time poor, not because we're not well organised. And a question that was early on, so this probably goes back to the philosophy at the start of your presentation. The question is, what does it take to make a team? Um, it, it's, it's a big part of your craft. Um, and, okay, so the coach's personality um, I, I've seen many wonderful coaches and many terrible coaches and the range of personalities across them, there's no one way. So extroverts don't make great coaches. Uh, introverts don't make horrible coaches, for example. It doesn't work that way. So uh, your personality can work for you it can also work against you. So what I mean by that is that you have to find the ways that your personality is limiting you being effective, and then you have to um, leverage off your personality strengths. So then take that to a team. And uh, it is up to you to find ways that connection with the players that you have on your team uh, can work and I think it's something that you've got to carefully evaluate and have an awareness and watch your players and athletes watch them and evaluate them and analyze them and uh, one of the things I'm very proud about at the Melbourne Boomers right now is that the stability of our roster is very high and in basketball terms we've got players that have been with me now for four five and six years which is a long time in a pro basketball environment because I feel like we've got that part of it right. However, there have been personalities that um, 
I've really struggled to connect with. And if I can't connect well with them, then I find it difficult to get them on the page. So in terms of team building, I think it's it's a really careful and very deep dive into uh, self-awareness of your own personality and then building a good knowledge of the people that you allow on the team bus. And the more that you can uh, get the right people in sync with you and on that bus, then the easier, the more organic that process is going to be. And I think our last question for tonight is is about the, the Deakin Melbourne Boomers and how you're dealing with the squad in this time of COVID. And are you doing any online training? Or is that one-on-one or in a, in a squad or group? So just a bit about where you're at at the moment. Uh, well, thankfully um, for us, because I know that uh, it's a very difficult time for the mental health of, of our state's population right now. Uh, thankfully, um, uh, elite sporting teams, of, of uh, which we're classified as one with the Melbourne Boomers, have got an exemption to be able to travel and train at a closed venue, um, which has only just occurred in the last week or so. Um, and um, we're having small group sessions of four or five people. But it's difficult, you know. So I've got a couple of players that are, or, sorry, I've got three players that are overseas at the moment. Um, we have little clear idea of when they may make it back to the country. I've got two players based in Queensland at the moment, so the borders are shut there. Uh, we can't bring them in at the moment. Um, so it, the, the preparation of the team is out of our control. And, and again, um, all I can think to do is that uh, what's in front of us, what's within our control, we've been very fortunate to give this training exemption, been given this training exemption. So we're taking the four or five players that we, we do have. Uh, there are another few kids that are NCAA bound that, that are stuck because they can't get their visas off the uh, American consulate yet. Uh, they're coming down as well. And we're just getting to work on, on some skills. And, and that's what we're doing. It's not ideal preparation. Um, but I, I think that, uh, you know, everybody's really happy that they're able to get out of the house and, and do a little bit of training uh, a few times a week. No worries, Guy. We might leave it there. Really appreciate you, your time tonight. Um, it's been fantastic. I think you've put a lot, a lot of great information across to our coaches. I'm now going to hand back to our host, Mr Roberts, for you to uh, close. No thanks, worries. Thanks. thanks Thanks very much, guys. Just wanted to say thanks, David Huxtable from BBC for uh, emceeing tonight. Thanks, Guy, for rounding off our four sessions. Um, so fantastic presentation tonight. Uh, as we said to everyone, this, these will be available uh, recording. Uh, and thanks, uh, obviously, to our other partners in Collingwood and uh, Melbourne Victory, as well as to Gip Sport and our state sporting associations. So thanks, everyone, for joining us. And uh, Gip Sport will get these recordings out to you in the near future. So thanks very much.